Okay, well, welcome everybody to uh, C21U and our uh, seminar series on um, uh, factors influencing higher education and uh, uh, ways we can make it better. Uh, we're very happy today to have uh, Tom Reeves, who is a emeritus professor at another place uh, <laughs> at UGA. Uh, that's a many many uh, former UGA folks here uh, today. Uh, Tom is a uh, Renowned speaker, world traveler, multi-book author who's won all sorts of awards, which I was going to read off here. No, don't do that. Them, I can't remember them all uh, for that. But more than that, uh, Tom was my major professor when I was in the doctor program at, at the University of Georgia. Uh, a good friend, but, but more than that, uh, he also uh, gave me a place to live when I was there. So I, I lived with Tom for a year uh, and, and would have lived longer than that with him. Except he got married, and, and one day at breakfast, his wife very politely asked, Steve, where are you going to live now? So I, I realized that, uh, I wasn't living there uh, anymore. Uh, but Tom is always a fascinating speaker. Uh, uh, he's been working for a long time on uh, education design research uh, and also looking at MOOCs and, and their impact around the, the planet. And I don't know where he's going to go uh, with this, but... Uh, Welcome, Tom, and thanks. We're looking forward to it. Well, thanks, Steve. It's always great to be back at Georgia Tech. I come over here every 10 years and get an invited talk. So it's, uh, it's fun, and it's especially fun because I see not just Steve, but other former students uh, here in the audience. So uh, that's fantastic. So I gave a version of this talk uh, two weeks ago as a keynote in Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, this morning, I noticed that they had posted uh, my keynote online, the video and so forth. Um, and I thought, well, if I get stuck in traffic, I'll just call Steve and send him the URL and he can play it. But actually, I changed it quite a bit last night, so it's not quite the same thing. But educational design research is, uh, was developed in the early 1990s. Uh, in the United States, it's more often called design-based research. But in Europe, they prefer the term educational design research. And uh, just wrote a second edition of the book and uh, uh, with Susan McKinney, who's a professor at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. So that's why we uh, adopted uh, that uh, title rather than design-based research. But it's basically this, the same thing. And I think design-based research, educational design research, has a lot of applications in many areas. But I'm particularly concerned about how well we're preparing our students to grapple with this coming world of where machine learning and robotics and so forth may take over a lot of the traditional careers that we prepare our students for. And I feel like, you know, who am I to come to Georgia Tech and talk about this because you're the people that are creating a lot of this stuff and are on the cutting edge. And so I'll probably say some naive things. And uh, if I do, please forgive me. Um, so I teach at the University of Georgia. I've been there since 1982. My wife, Tricia Reeves, who kicked Steve out of her home, uh, is also a professor. She's a professor of social work. Happy to report she's retiring as a, at the end of July, so we'll both be retired then. I'm a prof professor emeritus, so I keep an office on campus. I still help out primarily with fundraising, teaching people's classes when they're traveling, informally advising doctoral students, and so forth. And this is Button and Zipper. Uh, our two West Highland Terriers. We've had Westies for 30 years, so we're rather fond of this breed of dog. Uh, so, artificial intelligence. I know most of you in this room, are, are there any graduate students in the room, by the way? Any graduate students? Okay. They're probably in the library study. Uh, but uh, m most of you have advanced degrees, probably all of you, and you might think, well, you know, this. Uh, Machine learning stuff is advancing rapidly. Robots are advancing rapidly. They're not going to, but they're not going to take my job. My job is too sophisticated, too uh, complex for this technology. Well, maybe by the end of this presentation, a little seed of doubt might be planted. Um, so one of these is a robot. Obviously, uh, you can see which one. The other one's a human, and these are uh, have been developed by Professor. Uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro, I'm sure I'm butchering his name, at Osaka University in Japan. And he and his uh, team uh, are promising that they are developing human-like robots that will be able to express human emotions. They're promising by within uh, five years to have a robot that will be able to be happy, sad, 
uh, afraid, surprised, angry, and disgusted. Uh, sounds like uh, uh, me when I read the news these days, <laughs> angry and disgusted. Um, but um, it's attracted a lot of attention, as you might know, I'm sure, <coughs> both in the scientific world and in business, the business world. Um, now, I grew up, I was born in 1947. I grew up in a time when there were robots on the covers of magazines then as well, but there were two types of robots. One was the friendly, <coughs> excuse me, warm robot that was going to take down our Christmas tree or put up our Christmas tree. And the other was this horrific robot that was going to come and destroy us all. So there were two different visions of what robots. Now I find, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I've got, I got some water here, Steve, yeah. Um, I find that Time Magazine is a good way of just kind of tracking developments in these kinds of areas. So this was a 1950 issue of Time Magazine cover story about the Mark III computer that uh, Harvard was developing for the U.S. Navy. And in it, it talked about the applications of the computer and so forth, but then it also questioned whether or not this type of technology, and remember, this is 1950, that's a long time ago, that whether machines with superhuman brains would actually uh, be able to outthink us. And uh, they said the men, notice the men who designed them, tried to deny that they're creating their own intellectual competitors. Not so sure a lot of people can deny that today. All right, march along about 30 years, and we have the robot revolution featured on the co copy of Time. And this is the one we're probably most familiar with in the sense that Robotics have taken over a lot of manufacturing jobs and, uh, uh, you know, assembly lines. Uh, they said they, you know, look like uh, giant birds, uh, a row of giant birds doing this work and so forth. Then march ahead another uh, uh, 30 years or so, and you have a special issue uh, in uh, 1915, uh, excuse me, 2015, about the singularity. And... Uh, this issue talked about when man, people, <laughs> will become immortal, uh, 2045, and the singularity, of course, is the time when these technologies, in terms of their power to think and uh, perceive and see and so forth, will uh, exceed ours. And, uh, you know, uh, whether, I won't be around to see it, but certainly some of you will. Um, and so there are two visions of the singularity. Uh, one vision is a very utopian vision. People like Ray uh, Kurzweil talk about, uh, hi Colin, see you. Um, and uh, I've never met Colin, but I know him through Facebook. So <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the uh, utopian vision thinks that we will actually merge with these systems and we'll become immortal. Then there's the dystopian version uh, that other people write about, our final invention, and that these systems will one day wake up and say, you know, I don't think we really need those humans, you know? Well, let's just uh, nauseate them, we'll keep a few for zoos and uh, experiments and so forth, but we don't really need them anymore. Uh, even the popular press takes notice of these developments. This is a cover of the New Yorker from a couple years ago. And I, I love this cover because, as you know, I'm a big dog fan. And you see this homeless guy and the robot's tossing a few gears in his cup. And the little dog down there is rather dubious uh, of looking at the robotic dog. Now, um, uh, here's a close-up of that. Uh, robotic dogs have been around for 20 years. Sony introduced its... Uh, I, I, AIBO, AIBO, 20 years ago, and it didn't sell very well. It was kind of expensive, didn't have many capabilities. But more recently, they've introduced a new version of AIBO. And it, for $1,700, you can have one of these, and you pay a $50 a month uh, fee to download all the data that your dog and all the other dogs that are out there are perceiving. And so your dog gets smarter and smarter. In fact, it was just announced in Japan, they, they have uh, linked up Aewo with a security company. So now your, 
your robotic dog actually becomes a watchdog. And if there's something suspicious, your robotic dog uh, can uh, inform the police. Scary thought, but. And so, you know, if you, if you know about these things, please don't tell my dogs, okay? <laughs> Button and Zipper worry enough that we might get a cat. If they thought they could be replaced by a robot, they would really be distressed. Uh, now, what about love in a robot? There's been a lot of speculation lately uh, about, uh, you know, whether or not these humanoid, intel intelligent uh, robots would be lovable, or you could have a relationship with them. Uh, people have written books. The one on the left is published by MIT Press. Uh, robot Sex, Social and Ethical Implications, Love and Sex with the Robots. This is another interesting development, and I don't think our ethical or uh, legal systems have really contemplated what this might be. But please don't tell my wife about these developments, okay? I know she won't get a robot dog, but if she knows about this, she, she might think about replacing me. Now, I've been studying learning since 1966. This is actually, uh, in that's me right in the middle there, and at Troop County High School down near LaGrange, Georgia, and I'm putting a rat in a three-stage rocket. And um, the, uh, it's interesting, uh, the rat survived, but it was a, a, an experimental design. We had two rats, Julia and Susan, named after the top cheerleaders. And uh, one, they had both been trained to uh, run a maze. We blasted Julia off in the rocket. She was recovered successfully. Uh, and we put them both back in the maze, and guess what we found? No significant, no significant differences. And so educational research goes on. But, uh, so I have a long history with uh, educational research. Now, 10 years before my experiment with the rats, folks met at Dartmouth College, and uh, they actually coined the term uh, artificial intelligence at that time. And in their initial efforts, they were really trying to replicate human thinking. And so they, the thought was that they could program computers to learn all the moves of chess that various chess masters had used and so forth, and that eventually uh, the AI systems would be able to beat a master. Well, that didn't happen. And then uh, they switched the, uh, how the, the approach, and so they developed what are called deep learning approaches. And again, I know you know way more about this than I do, but basically the notion is that rather than teach the AI systems everything that humans know, let the systems learn on themselves. And so they basically let Big Blue, the IBM computer, play millions and millions of chess games and develop its own expertise as a chess player. And we all know that a few years later, uh, Gary Gasparov, the then chess champion, was defeated by the big blue computer. More recently, the same uh, type of system developed, uh, was developed to beat the world master in the game Go, which is infinitely more complex than chess. So uh, lots of uh, de developments in this area. Uh, and along with this uh, kind of speculation are lots of some good scientific work, a lot of you know, yellow journalism, if you will, predicting that some cases 25%, some cases as high as 50% of all current jobs will be eliminated by these systems within the foreseeable future. Uh, a lot of people talk about 2025 as being the critical year for that. Now, uh, people are writing about this, and it's not just, you know, manufacturing jobs or, or drivers of trucks and so forth that we've replaced by driverless cars, but the profession. So the Suskins are an unusual couple, uh, father-son team, actually. Uh, Richard Suskin is one of the top jurists in the UK, and his son is an economics professor at Oxford. And they wrote a book about the future of the professions in which they predict that physicians and, and uh, teachers and other, uh, uh, other professionals will be replaced soon by these uh, develop, developments. Yes, sir. They sure did. Um, and um, 
Other people have written books. Martin Ford uh, is a kind of a science writer, but he also has a scientific background. His book, The Rise of the Robots, probably has gained uh, more attention than most of these kinds of books. But he gives many examples of how journalists will be replaced by these systems. Uh, pharmacists, for example, uh, he gives an example at uh, the uh, Univers University of San Francisco Medical Center uh, where they give out 10,000 uh, prescriptions a day without a human pharmacist being involved. So they have a central repository and these robots go and say you're a patient there and you need to have an aspirin, this uh, robot system goes to the central depository, gets your aspirin, it's bar barcoded, brings it to your bedside, the nurse wands you, wands the medication, and they've significantly reduced errors in medications there. I, it's interesting, I don't know if you can read this, but it says, please do not enter robot, uh, elevator with the robot. I wonder what that's all about. Uh, so, and even teachers are being replaced. This is a headline from uh, right here at Georgia Tech, uh, where uh, uh, apparently uh, this professor uh, has uh, developed a uh, AI uh, graduate assistant, and the claim is uh, that uh, the students in his online course can't detect differences in the feedback they get from the AI-based uh, graduate assistants and the human graduate assistants. Now, are there signs of hope for us? Uh, well, uh, Eric Brynolfsson and Andrew McAfee, I butchered their names too, wrote a book, The Second Machine Age, and they uh, talk about three basic core human capabilities that these smart intelligent systems will not be able to replicate within the foreseeable future. One of them is ideation, creativity, coming up with new ideas. Another one is broad frame pattern recognition, the ability to see complex problems and uh, bring in all kinds of different data, political, economic, social, et cetera, and recognize what's going on. And then complex communication, to be able to have empathy and, and other types of human skills in order to uh, complex with diverse populations and so forth. Um, the question I ask, though, is are our students developing these skills? And if they aren't, is it our responsibility to see that they do? Uh, are they really learning to be creative? Are they learning to recognize complex problems? Uh, are they uh, able to communicate clearly in multiple forms of communication with empathy and care and so forth? Uh, it's an open question, I think. I was mentioning that I, I've done some work at the Air Force Academy, and uh, they uh, are very concerned there that uh, their cadets, who may graduate with an almost perfect GPA because they want to become pilots more than anything else, uh, aren't learning these things. And so they're trying to develop new programs to help them develop these skills. And so what is the, how could educational research play a role here? Uh, educational research, particularly educational technology research, my field, doesn't have a very good track record when it comes to addressing these significant real world problems. What's the number 1066 mean to you? William the Conqueror, invasion of the Roman Ding, thanks for playing. <laughs> yes, the Battle of Hastings. But it's also the number of educational research journals that are published. 1,066 educational research journals that are ranked by uh, SJR. Um, that's a lot of journals. In my field, educational technology, there are scores of journals. I used to be the editor of one of these uh, journals. I uh, review for uh, most of those at various times. And uh, so we keep pumping out lots and lots of research, but is it really having an impact? And is it addressing the fundamental problems of education today? The cases for that isn't very good. Uh, there's too much research on things. Every time a new thing comes out, it's going to revolutionize education. And you know, uh, these days it's 3D printers or virtual reality, wearable technology, mobile learning, iPads, et cetera, et cetera. Every new technology is 
really predictable that when a new technology is introduced, and they always come from outside education, they're tossed over the walls of the classroom and they're supposed to revolutionize teaching and learning. We don't have much research on problems. What are the problems that we face? Lack of student engagement, lack of intellectual curiosity in our students, un underdeveloped creativity, weak communication skills, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these are the problems. All of our research should start with a focus on problems, but unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, here's an example of the type of research that gets published. And uh, this was a doctoral dissertation done in 2015, got published in Educause Review, uh, paper or tablet, reading, recall, and comprehension. Okay, so remember my experiment with the rats in 1966? This really isn't very different. Um, and so what they did is they conducted this study at the uh, Coast Guard Leadership Development Center and it was an experimental study, the gold standard for educational research, according to some. Uh, 231 students were randomly assigned to either a digital tablet version of a reading or 100, 112 students to a paper version. The reading was an 800-word leadership article. It wasn't even aligned with the course they were in, uh, the uh, people that were in this course. Uh, the treatment time for this experiment was less than 10 minutes. Uh, they had 10 multiple choice questions, pre and post tests to measure recall, and two short essay questions to measure comprehension. And Steve, what did they find? No significant differences. No significant differences. Why did they even do this study? How was it approved as a PhD dissertation at a land uh, a, 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 a really good university. I won't say which one. University of Connecticut. No, I didn't say that. Um, but how was this approved as a doctoral dissertation? But it was, and it was published. Uh, and this goes on. This goes on. This was a headline just from last month. Uh, in, uh, this study was done at Cornell, another good institution. Study finds no difference in virtual reality learning outcomes compared to other modes. What did they do? Experimental study. A third of the students were assigned to a hands-on activity to learn about the phases of the moon. A third of the students took a traditional computer-based simulation program about phases of the moon. And a third of the students used this VR program about the phases of the moon. And you guessed it they found no significant differences. Um, why do we continue to do research like this? Well, this is where our book comes in. We think there's a better way to do research in education, and that's educational design research, or if you will, design-based research. So how does it start? First and foremost, it starts with the identification of a serious problem. Students aren't engaged. Students aren't uh, developing intellectual curiosity. Students aren't developing creative skills. They don't think of themselves as creative. Whatever the really big problem is. And then close collaboration with practitioners, teachers, faculty, others who own this problem, an important pedagogical challenge. Then you create a prototype solution to meet this problem, this challenge, informed <coughs> excuse me, by the best possible theory and by the best possible practice. You want to emphasize content and pedagogy rather than technology alone. In fact, it may be that through the process you find that technology really doesn't have a role here. We have to change something else, maybe the assessment procedures or whatever. Uh, give special attention to supporting human interactions. Then you go through multiple iterative cycles of testing, refinement, and retesting solutions until the problem is alleviated. And at the same time, you are refining theory. You're building new theory, usually in the form of reusable design principles. So that's kind of a, a synopsis of how this works. This is our model, and I'm, I'm going to use this model as a way of illustrating with a case study of a di doctoral dissertation that are, uh, and was involved in as a co-supervisor. Um, but um, basically, 
again, you go through a phase of analysis and exploration that leads into a phase of design and construction of your prototype solution. Then you go through these iterative cycles of evaluation and reflection, all with the goal of developing a mature intervention and the new theoretical understanding. Now the problem with this uh, diagram, it looks like you do one, then the other, then the other. You don't. You're going back and forth. It's very iterative in its process. Also, you're trying to pay attention to implementation and spread. If we're doing this study at Georgia Tech, uh, we might be interested in how this could be applied at Carnegie Mellon or MIT or other engineering schools. And so uh, we want to pay attention to those things as well. So I want to show you a case, a case study of a PhD dissertation that I co-supervised with Jan Harrington from Murdoch University in Australia. And uh, the student was Jim Vesper, now Dr. Jim Vesper. And uh, we, uh, Jim, I'd known Jim for many years. He's one of the world's experts on good manufacturing practices for pharmaceutical vaccines and other perishable pharmaceutical products. He's written books on it. He's a very uh, a keynote speaker all over the place, but he didn't have a doctorate. So one time I was talking with Jim and he said, you know, I really would love to get a PhD, but I can't afford to go back to school. And, you know, I've got my own company. I've got too many uh, commitments and so forth. And I said, well, you know, you could do your dissertation by research only through an Australian university. And I'd spent a lot of time in Australia, about two years all told, and I'd worked with Jan Harrington for many years. We'd written a book together, and, and uh, I'd spent five months working with her in Western Australia. So I knew about her excellent uh, supervision skills. So I uh, introduced them, and Jim decided to do his dissertation with her, and I was the co-supervisor. Now, I like to get my students, you know, educational design research, research starts with emphasis on a significant problem. So I try to get my students to refer to an external framework of significant problems. In this case, Jim was focused on good health and well-being, which is one of the sustainable, 17 sustainable development goals developed by the United Nations. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is vaccine quality management. Jim and I are both consultants for the World Health Organization, and the World Health Organization has a big technical and human problem, and that is managing the quality of vaccines around the world. It's both a human problem and a technological problem. Uh, vaccines have to be kept, most vaccines have to be kept at a narrow temperature range between four and eight degrees centigrade. And if they get too cold, they're ruined. If they get too warm, they're ruined. So they have something called the cold chain management problem. Anytime vaccines, I say they're manufactured in France and then they're shipped to a port in Turkey and then they eventually get down to uh, a remote village for use with children, those vaccine temperatures have to be tracked and you have to make sure that they were never affected by the temperatures. So what the, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, the solution the World Health Organization has had for the last 15 years, is once a year, they run what they call the bus course. And I went on the bus course. The bus course uh, takes place in Turkey, and uh, what they do is they bring in 15 people from developing countries who are involved in the cold chain. And these are professionals. They're physicians. They're pharmacists. They're public health inspectors. And they travel down the cold chain in Turkey. Turns out that Turkey has one of the highest quality vaccine management systems in the world. They have a 99% compliance rate with infant uh, inoculations. We have parts of this country where it's, you know, much, much lower. And then you, surely you've seen the news about measles and so forth. Uh, so we drove down, uh, we went from Izmir where we looked at a big warehouse where vaccines were stored, university hospitals, provincial health centers, right down to the point of, of uh, where the f uh, vaccines were administered in various uh, settings. The students, again, they're all professionals, they work in teams in three during the bus course to figure out how, 
how they could use the lessons they're learning in Turkey in their own countries to come up with improved plans for managing the uh, vaccine uh, cold chain in their countries. Uh, we involve the students a lot. It's a very experiential course. Uh, uh, they do the program of the day, they do the evaluation of the day, those sorts of things. There's a lot of authentic tasks built into this bus course. On the first day, they are given vials of vaccine and all kinds of packing materials, and their team has to package of these vials of vaccines, and then they're put up underneath the bus, and a week later they're taken out, and, and we see which of the vaccines are still viable. How good a packing job did they do? Again, they visit all these various sites, and uh, they uh, then get right down to the you know, administration of the vaccines and so forth. Um, so the problem was uh, that only 15, the WHO can only afford to do this once a year, and um, they need, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who need this course. And so the problem uh, became, well, how could we enable more people to do this? And the obvious answer was an online course. Now, when I first broached this, I'd written a book called A Guide to Authentic E-Learning. And uh, when I first broached this with the WHO, they said, well, we can't fit a bus on a computer screen. Well, that's what we set ourselves out to do. And this is the context for uh, Jim Vesper's PhD dissertation. So here's our little model up here. Um, and um, I'm going to go show you uh, what you do during these phases. So the analysis and exploration phase, you do a lot of the traditional things you do in any PhD study. You do a literature review and uh, orientation to the problem. You consult with stakeholders, do various field-based investigations. You're also doing exploration of the best possible practice in this area, site visits, professional meetings, networking, et cetera. And uh, so, um, then, um, uh, so we had lots of meetings around the world. Uh, this was a meeting, we actually rented a house up at Lake Lanier, and we brought in some of the world's experts on cold chain management. This uh, gentleman uh, is from Chicago, he's one of the leading experts on cold chain management. This gentleman's from London, he's from the World Health Organization in uh, Geneva. And that's Jim, my student, and myself. And we spent days just you know, brainstorming and, and figuring out how could we put this experiential learning course, the bus course, online. Then, and again, I'm jumping really fast, but you go into a phase of design and construction, and you're exploring solutions, mapping solutions, creating prototypes, and so forth. This is the kind of bread and butter work that you do here all the time. Um, and so we would meet again in various places. This is a meeting in Turkey uh, where uh, Umut is uh, a physician at the WHO, kind of the brain behind this uh, bus course. Um, myself, Jim, the doctoral student, and uh, a fellow from a company called Appella in Turkey that ended up programming our online course. And again, we spent days and days hammering away at identifying the objectives, the feasibility of doing various things in the course and so forth. Uh, we used uh, a, the book I mentioned earlier that Jan Harrington and Ron Oliver and I wrote called A Guide to Authentic E-Learning. And this book has uh, a nine critical factors that should be in any online course. And so I'll use these just, uh, factors to these design principles to illustrate this course that we developed. So authentic context and task. The students in this course play different roles. It's a, we converted the one-week bus course into a 12-week online course. Again, the learners are professionals in developing countries. They spend the first seven weeks in the course experiencing the simulated problems that they would have experienced if they had been on the bus. The last five weeks of the course, they actually work with developing the public health agencies of developing countries as consultants to help them address real world problems in the cold chain. So they take on realistic roles, uh, deciding if a vaccine has been affected by freezing or not, real world tasks. Uh, 
uh, and uh, tasks like which vaccines could be used first. Other problems like, uh, oh, uh, you've got to get these vaccines to this uh, regional health center, but your refrigerated truck has broken down. How are you going to package these vaccines in order to get them there safely? The, the students work in three-person teams again to solve these, come up with their solutions and so forth. So authentic context and tasks. And we really tried to address the higher order uh, parts of the uh, cognitive uh, uh, zone of uh, various types of outcomes. So rather than just lower order ones, uh, remembering, understanding, applying, we really try to get into analyzing, evaluating, and creating solutions. Uh, and then working with real clients. Again, the last five weeks of the course, they work with, as consultants, to real countries. Uh, we use Albania sometimes. We use uh, several sub-Saharan African countries. They submit their challenges. Then these professionals work to help them address their problems. They, in the course, they have access to lots of expert performances uh, on various topics like thermodynamics and, and uh, Im improving access and so forth. Um, the students throughout the course change roles. They play roles of a pharmacist or a consultant or a GDP inspector and, and so forth. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a typical class. Uh, here you have students from all over the world and you have two instructors, one of them being Jim Vesper, my PhD student, the other being Umit Kartuglu from uh, an MD at the World Health Organization. And uh, we call our courses authentic learning uh, because of the emphasis on authentic task. Uh, so here's a typical team of students, one from Nigeria, one from Sri Lanka, one from Micronesia, and they are involved in collaborative construction of new knowledge. Uh, again, the first seven weeks, simulated problems, the last five weeks, real world problems. They do a lot of reflection in the course, they keep diaries and logs and so forth. Uh, we use a lot of uh, opportunities for them to articulate and share their knowledge. Uh, one tool we love is called Flipgrid. How many of you are familiar with Flipgrid? Uh, it was developed at the University of Minnesota by our mutual friend Charlie Miller, uh, and uh, it's a wonderful tool, mainly used in K-12 education, but we use it with the World Health Organization and other groups are using it as well. Charlie. Uh, left academia, he got $17 million worth of venture funding to develop Flipgrid and then uh, IBM uh, or Microsoft, Microsoft bought it. Um, so uh, we have a lot of coaching and scaffolding in the course. We promise students they'll get feedback on their assignments within 24 hours. Uh, we use uh, Google Docs and other tools for them to submit their work and to provide uh, feedback uh, again, lots of coaching and scaffolding. The assessments, it's not like they do all this studying and then they take a test. The assessments are built right into the authentic task. And that's really the essence of the authentic e-learning model that we try to promote. So they're doing these real tasks. They're uh, creating videos to show their work and, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> and this is what the course looks like. Um, and uh, here you have the first seven weeks of the course represented at these various facilities that they visit. And uh, then we've got all kinds of resources and, and so forth. And, and I'm going to leave these slides with Steve, and you can have these, and you can go out and take a, a look at the course if you're interested. Um, something I've been emphasizing for decades is that technology is a tool to learn with, not a technology to learn from. One of the big problems with, I've written another book about MOOCs, and uh, some contributors are in the room uh, to that book, but um, a lot of the MOOCs, unfortunately, particularly the uh, X MOOCs, emphasize learning from technology. They have lots of videos and so forth for content delivery, uh, and they don't really emphasize using the technology as a cognitive tool for problem solving, knowledge construction, creating meaningful interfacts and communication and collaboration. Um, again, in our course, we use a lot of different uh, programs. We use the Appella as the core 
course, but then we link out to lots of other types of tools. Uh, now, then Jim went into a phase of evaluation and reflection uh, for this particular course. Lots of uh, uh, field testing and, and uh, collecting di different types of data. And uh, so, for example, this was our initial design for the course interface. And you can see it's very creative, but when we put this in front of public health inspectors and pharmacists and doctors, they thought it was a joke and they didn't like it. And we also had e-learning experts review it and they didn't like it either. So we modified it and this went through multiple iterations of Jim collecting the data, but this is what the course looks like now. It's still a map, but it's much easier to perceive, not so cartoony and so forth. Um, another uh, thing we found was that uh, these learners who are professionals in their own right, collaborative learning is new for most of them. And so we really had to nurture collaborative learning. We built in lots of games in the first couple weeks of the course and other things where they could f form bonds and, and uh, uh, build good collaboration. Um, so out of this type of research, Jim identified uh, nine design principles. I'm just gonna quickly tell you about three. How am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, the first design principle when you come to e-learning is rather than perfectly duplicate, replicate where possible and innovate where necessary. So, for example, I mentioned that in the bus course, we had them pack vaccines on the first day, put them underneath the bus, and then at the end of the week, they take them out and we see which ones are still viable. Couldn't do that in the online course. Instead, we did other types of things. For example, one of the skills that these folks need is the ability to do the shake test. If you have vaccines that you think might be, have, have been frozen, you can shake the vials and watch how the sediment falls and, and detect whether or not it's been uh, frozen. So we taught that in the bus course. We also teach that online. We actually uh, send them vials of vaccine and we have them record videos of themselves doing the shake test and uh, demonstrating that they have that skill. Another design principle is that collaborative learning is a new experience for most learners and has to be nurtured. In the bus, on the bus, they form teams naturally, they bond. Every night we set up a classroom at dinner and they talk about what they learned during the day and so forth. Uh, online, we had to uh, really do a lot of work to help people build uh, the team spirit that they needed to, to do in a course like this. Last design principle, the fidelity of authentic e-learning must be sufficient to allow learners to suspend disbelief and feel like what they're experiencing is real. And so we really hired some fantastic videographers to go into all the facilities that they would have gone to on the real bus and <clears throat> they can these videos are fantastic. You can actually zoom in and go down and read an individual vial of vaccine. So, uh, and we got great feedback. Uh, people said that these videos were so, they felt like they were walking with the camera, something that makes the course so lively. Good news, Jim finished his PhD. He's now Dr. Vesper, uh, and that's Jan Harrington. I didn't get to go over for the graduation. Uh, Jim and Umit and I continue to collaborate. This was uh, a few months ago in Turkey where we were running some workshops. Um, and uh, in fact, Jim will be here in, oh, will be in Athens next week to uh, visit us. So the course has won awards around the world for its new authentic approach to online learning. And so the people at the World Health Organization are very pleased. So why isn't more research done this way? Why aren't we doing more design-based research? Maybe here at Georgia Tech you are, but the journals indicate that it's not happening in a lot of places. Part of it is the publisher parish. You know, unfortunately, traditional quasi-experimental, experimental studies can be designed and done very rapidly. Your treatments can be 10 minutes, and uh, you can get your results published in journals. Voila, you get tenure and promotion. We need to change this system. We need to have 
evidence collected that people are really having an impact, that their research is having an impact. That'll probably never happen, but <laughs> we can hope. I think most people in my field of educational technology would love to do research this way, but unfortunately the funding sources and so forth tend to favor the traditional approaches. We have enormous needs in education. Uh, we have to have a more socially responsible research agenda that focuses on problems that matter. You know, this one is a recent time cover. I have a master's degree, 16 years of experience, work two extra jobs, and donate blood plasma to pay the bills. I'm a teacher in America. This is a big problem. We have teachers right here in Atlanta that can uh, live, tell that they live this story as well. We continue to come up with a list of the greatest technologies, the 30 technologies of the new decade. And unfortunately, most of the research that will get published will be focused on these things rather than significant problems. I think our doctoral students should be required to situate their doctoral research in the context of a significant problem. There are lots of them out there. So are we preparing our students to compete with this brave new world of machine learning and robots? I mentioned these three core skills that supposedly these systems won't be able to do anytime soon. Ideation, broad frame pattern recognition, complex communication. I recently read an article from Autodesk where they had machine learning AI systems that design new uh, airplane doors that look bizarre. They look bizarre, but they're 60% lighter than anything human designers could come up with. And so airlines like Lufthansa are adopting these designs that were designed without human input. Um, so maybe ideation is going by the by. What about complex communication? You probably saw this story uh, last month where IBM sponsored uh, a debate between the world's best debater and their system. And in the end, the, uh, the topic was should we invest in preschools? In the end, the human uh, judges voted that the human had won the debate. But when they actually asked people in the audience, they said that the machine learning responses gave them more information about the significance of the problem. So maybe it won't be too long before these systems can win debates as well. It's happening fast. So we face, I think, a critical time in our history. Um, and so maybe I'm like uh, the boy that cried wolf. And a few years from now, you'll think, hey, remember that Reeves guy that came over here and talked about Robots replacing my job. Well, that never happened. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll remind you, Voltaire said, judge a man by the questions he raises rather than by his solutions. But uh, I'll leave you with another quote from Voltaire. He said, uh, everything is fine. That is our delusion. Thank you. So we have time for some questions and comments, and I think we've got nine minutes. Nine minutes. So I, I, I like the, uh, the tour you gave us of, of, of robotics and, and the difference between deep learning and, and other kinds of, of, of AI. And the, the, the one thing that occurred to me as you had that slide up that talks about About, about not being able to duplicate ideation or, 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 or inspiration um, is that apparently apparently um, deep learning is really good for finding uh, non-obvious ways to get to an answer that don't duplicate um, random random thought. You know, there's this old story about, about Bell Labs in the 1920s um, looking alarmingly at the growth of telephones in the U.S. And, and, um, and suggesting that everyone in the United States had to be a trained telephone operator. Uh, this 
switchboard operator in order to, to meet that to meet that demand, not anticipating, of course, that, that electronic switches would come in and, 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 and take that take that away. So 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 at, you know, as you as you think about these issues in light of in light of the fact that uh, there there may be innovation sitting out there in front of us that 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 makes the jobs obsolete, not automated. Obviously, but obviously yep. in the sense that no one has to do that yep. any, anymore. Do you have any thoughts about how to, how to address that? Yeah, well, it, it's a uh, thank you for that question. By the way, do you have a uh, student that you know that might be interested in this book? Or could you find one? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I already have the book. Uh, he already has it. Um, and. Um, <laughs> So that's a, a new 2019 uh, version of our book. But I really would like to inspire some students here at uh, Georgia Tech to use this approach. Um, but um, I think that um, you know there is this one theory is that as these new jobs are, or old jobs are taken away by advancements in technology, that they'll be replaced by new jobs. And that has happened quite a bit. But um, it seems to be turning now, and you know, for example, I was in South Africa a couple years ago, and everybody in South Africa is learning to be a web designer, uh, and that's well and good. But uh, you know, my wife teaches a course uh, at UGA about the human animal bond, and one of the assignments for the students is they have to design a website that reports about a really strong relationship between a human and an animal. Well, they use programs like Wix and Weebly and so forth. They don't need web designers. They come up with beautiful designs. And so we're training you know, generations of young people to think they're going to be web designers. And I don't think they're going to be. So um, I, you know, I, I don't know myself what's going to happen with that. Can I ask a question, maybe along those lines? Um, you talked about uh, learning from technology versus learning with technology. And, and I wonder if, if there's a part missing uh, that is working with the AI, working with the robotics. So, you know, like you get uh, design solutions that humans wouldn't have thought of, maybe. But who's going to interpret those solutions to uh, the regular human? So is there an aspect of, of working with this for that? Yeah, I think so. Um, but again, I hate to be a, a, a kind of a doom speaker or something, but. Uh, there's a program developed at Northwestern University called Quill. And Quill uh, can write a news story in 30 seconds. And a lot of uh, the editor of Wired magazine says that within a f three years, 90% of all news stories would be written by this type of software. So what happens is this Quill program, so let's say the stock market goes up or down, it, this program goes out and gathers all this information and zaps out a news story about it in 30 seconds. A human proofreads it. That's hardly a journalism job. And then it's put up on the web. So at Georgia, we have one of the top journalism schools in the country. Are we preparing people for obsolete, obsolete uh, future? I don't know. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a, another hopeful prospect that we could work with these tools. I'm sure, for example, with those Autodesk created AI airplane doors that human engineers had to then check the ideas and so forth. But when you look at these designs, they don't look like any, they look organic more than anything else. And, and, and yet, they are so much lighter and stronger than the doors that human engineers were able to create. So. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Would you like a copy of the book? No, he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. Well, that's uh, my son, Ian. Oh, Ian, I didn't recognize you. Hey, Ian, how you doing? He's a student here. I've known Ian since he was, wasn't was born. Uh, <laughs> I didn't recognize you. I'm sorry. I thought, well, he's young. Because uh, I had earlier asked her if there are any students here, and nobody raised a hand. <laughs> OK, that's OK. Um, well, that's a great question, Ian. 
My brother is an artist, uh, and uh, I've talked with him a lot about this. And of course, there are um, art programs, and uh, there are programs that are writing poetry now. There are programs that are writing, uh, uh, doing paintings, and so forth. Um, but I would love to think, my firm belief is that the aesthetics and beauty and uh, the truth of art uh, will remain our preserve. At least I hope so. I sure hope so, Ian. <laughs> uh, otherwise, um, it's a bleak world <laughs> for sure. Uh, I saw the other day, what was it? Some animal is doing paintings that look like Picasso. Oh, it was a pig. So there's a pig. Have you, did you see this story? There's a, and they're selling these pig Picasso paintings online. My sister-in-law did her PhD on Picasso at the art school at the University of Virginia. I haven't sent her that story yet. Um, another question. Yes, sir. In considering the problems that need solving, at what point are the social, economic, political, and cultural factors that cause those problems addressed? Because we know supply chain management and technology and money exists to solve that problem without force or, or any of what we've done. Yeah. We've solved a human created problem. So how do we address the real problem as opposed to just fixing the mess that we created? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, uh, that is absolutely critical. I took a slide out last night because I realized I had too many slides. Uh, but what, the slide I had was a picture, it was from the Chicago Tribune of a group of workers in Wisconsin who were being uh, replaced by robots. And the reason they were being replaced by robots not was because, not because of uh, the cost of paying them, but because of the cost of their health care, the cost of their um, drug treatments, uh, the, the manufacturers who were replacing these workers with robots. And the picture shows all these workers on break, and they're all out there. They're all uh, uh, smoking and so forth. Uh, the the, man, the uh, people who are replacing them say, well, you know, we, they don't, robots don't take sick days. They don't abuse opioid drugs and so forth. I mean, we have some enormous problems, uh, as you know. This morning on the news, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army. I heard that the housing at our bases it was outsourced to commercial entities, and now people are living in fungus-filled uh, uh, homes and so forth on our military bases. It's just corruption, basic corruption. So yeah, we have some enormous problems, and I don't know whether these developments are gonna help us address that or not. Um, it's a, a major concern. Do you have a student that might be interested in this book? Okay, great. Thank you. Well, Thank I do you. have a student, but I don't okay. know if he's interested. Okay, one, well, we're just, one last question. One last question. Um, I, I really like what you were saying about um, the kind of the action research model, design research model, as opposed to uh, quasi-experimental design. And, and you talked about that in your speculation on some institutional reasons why we don't do that. One thing that occurs to me is that to do what, what you did with the World Health imaginable kind of authentic experience like that. You actually need to get lots of stakeholders involved who aren't actually teaching or learning, but they're providing knowledge and they're providing support. And so that requires kind of a network that's domain specific that a school of education isn't going to have because yeah. it's about generic learning. Yeah. And I wonder if you have any ideas about how, who would do this? What yeah. kind, how, how would we do this other than particularly dedicated people with one PhD student studying this for yeah. three years? How could we institutionalize this approach in different areas rather yeah. than just in one area? Yeah. I would like to see some collaborations of some of the top doctoral programs in any given field with the professional associations to develop a deposit repository of significant problems that need to be addressed. Um, and whether that's, you know, kids learning algebra or calculus or 
whenever any given area or developing their creativity or their uh, self-confidence or whatever, it develop this repository of problems, and I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to turn that off. Um, and uh, the, um, you know, I think we, our associations and our doctoral programs need to come together to really get serious about this problem. Now, action research differs from design-based research in the sense that action research generally focuses just on a single teacher's or maybe a few teacher's problem, and they're not interested in theoretical contributions. Design-based research, educational design research, is really focused on not just developing a solution to a real-world problem, but also developing new theory. So that's the significant difference there. But that's a great question, Colin. I'm going to give you a book, and I hope you'll share it with someone you, you will know. And Maggie, I'm going to give you a book. You didn't get to ask your question. Okay. But this is an, another book that I helped uh, the folks at the WHO write. It's called Go Authentic, Activities That Support Learning. Steve has the URL where you can download this book. And uh, I think he's shared it widely. But, uh, thank you again for uh, your questions and your participation, and I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you.